Hey folks, this is Dr. White. Today we're going to expand our discussion of intermolecular forces and talk about how they manifest themselves in the macroscopic properties of systems. Macroscopic properties are properties that we can observe without the aid of any special instrumentation. Your homework to complete after viewing this video are to read pages 418 through 427 and do exercises 23, 31, 35, 37, 41, and 45 at the end of chapter 11. I recommend that for every slide you take some notes. First, let's review the three principal intermolecular forces. Do you remember them? I will give you a second to bring them up to the front of your brain. Come on, hurry up! Okay, let me help you out a little bit. The first and weakest force is the London dispersion force. This is present between all molecules in, in the condensed phase and is generated by instantaneous differences in electron density that occur when different molecular orbitals come into contact with each other. The second force, the dipole-dipole interaction, is stronger than the London dispersion forces and occurs when polar molecules orient themselves so that their partially positive ends line up with partially negative ends. The third force is the strongest and most specialized, hydrogen bonding. This force occurs when two very electronegative nuclei, oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, share a hydrogen, hydrogen atom between them. This is the strongest force and is present in, in important liquids such as water and ammonia. In condensed materials, all of these forces combine and manifest themselves macroscopically in the form of different properties of those materials. Let's discuss some of those properties. Viscosity is a very important property that is determined by the extent of intermolecular interactions. It is formally defined as a liquid's resistance to flow. Can you think of everyday liquids with different viscosities? Two examples that I can think of with different viscosities are dishwashing soap and water. The dish soap is more viscous or syrupy than water is. Viscosity increases when stronger intermolecular forces are present and decreases with increased temperature. Have you ever wondered about how water striders can walk on water? They are able to do this because of surface tension. Surface tension is defined as the net inward force that occurs between molecules on the surface of a liquid. Over the trillions of molecules that make up the surface area of water, this tension can hold up objects with densities greater than that of the actual liquid, like a water strider. Now, the two properties that I just talked about, viscosity and surface tension, both are inherent to the liquid state. But what about the other states of matter? It turns out that the intermolecular forces also affect the transitions between the different phases or states of matter. There are three different states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. When we change from one state to the next, we call this a phase change. Between the three different states, there are six different phase changes, and they all have their own special names. All three states and the six phase changes are shown here as a function of system energy. The endothermic processes are in red. Do you remember what endothermic means? And the exothermic processes are shown in green. First, let's look at the endothermic processes. When we change from a solid to a liquid, we call it melting. If we add more heat to the system, the liquid will turn into a gas. We call that vaporization. If the solid goes directly to a gas, we call that process sublimation. Next, let's look at the process the processes that give off heat when they occur. When a gas changes to a liquid, we call it condensation. If we take more heat out of the liquid, it will eventually turn into a solid. We call this freezing. And when a gas goes directly to a solid, we call this deposition. 
The intrinsic intermolecular forces of each material determine how much energy it will take to make those phase changes occur. Chemists have fancy names for these energies too. The energy required to turn a solid into a liquid at its melting point is called the heat of fusion. This same amount of energy is given off when a liquid turns into a solid. Remember that the process of freezing is an exothermic process. Heat is given off. The amount of energy required to turn a liquid to a gas at its boiling point is called heat of vaporization. Notice from the graph shown that it takes quite a bit more energy to put a substance into the gaseous state than to merely go from a solid to a liquid. When ice is melted into liquid water, for example, it only takes 6 kilojoules per mole. To turn liquid into a gas, it takes a whopping 41 kilojoules per mole. That is about 7 times the energy. Now, it is important to know that the heats of fusion and vaporization do not represent the amount of energy it takes to heat a substance up to its melting point or boiling point. It is only the amount of energy to make the phase change happen. Consider a pot of water. You can heat up that water by adding thermal energy from the burner. The temperature of the water will rise until it reaches 100 degrees C, at which time it will start to boil. After this point, will the temperature rise above 100 degrees C? The answer is no. So then, what happens to the thermal energy you're adding after it is boiling? That energy is going to the vaporization of the water molecules and not to increase the temperature of the water. That is why no matter how much heat you add to the boiling water, the temperature will always stay the same, 100 degrees C. Graphically, this phenomenon is shown here. The additional heat increases the temperature of the water until it reaches the melting or boiling points, at which time the temperature does not change and remains horizontal until the phase change process stops. Up until now, we have been talking about macroscopic changes. These are the changes we can see with our naked eyes. On the microscopic level, these general processes are much more dynamic. Let's take vaporization for example. It turns out that at any temperature some of the molecules have enough kinetic energy to undergo phase changes. This graph shows the, the statistical kinetic energy distribution of all the molecules in a liquid. All molecules on the right side of the dotted line have enough energy to escape the intermolecular bonds and become a gas. As the temperature is increased, more of the molecules end up on the right side of the line. These escaped molecules exert pressure on their surroundings like any other gas. This pressure is called vapor pressure, and as the temperature of the liquid increases, so does it until the liquid reaches the boiling point, at which time the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to atmospheric pressure, or 760 torr. For each different liquid, the temperature at which their vapor pressures reach atmospheric pressure is different. This is due to the amount of intermolecular attractions present within the liquid. Diethyl ether, shown in red, reaches a vapor pressure of 760 torr at 34.6 degrees Celsius, whereas ethanol does not reach this point until 78.3 degrees Celsius. Well, thanks for watching my video on phase changes in vapor pressure. I hope you enjoyed it. If you are still not clear on the concepts, you should replay this video. This is Dr. White signing off.